Regarde toi. À trois on pense. Un, deux. In the late 2000s, parkour emerged from obscurity and took over mainstream entertainment. Movies, YouTube videos, and video games alike took to the urban jungle so that they could showcase the activity in all of its glory and entertain audiences with fast-paced thrills. And no other video game managed to thrill quite like Mirror's Edge. The brainchild of Swedish video game developer DICE, Mirror's Edge thrust players into the shoes of Faith, a raven-haired courier tasked with delivering messages across the rooftops of a gleaming dystopia. While many found the sum of its offerings to be far from perfect, most agreed that running through the metropolis was a delight and that its clean, minimalist art was a welcome breath of fresh air from the browns and grays of its competitors. After Mirror's Edge came and went, however, it quickly became apparent that it would be a while longer before fans would be able to return to Faith's world. While DICE would repeatedly express its desires to continue building out its budding parkour series, rumors and news stories alike perpetually suggested that DICE either was at a crossroads on how to proceed with it or simply not working on it at all. And the more years that passed, the more the studio seemed to become further entrenched in the Battlefield franchise. In the end, however, the series would finally receive a second lease on life nearly a decade later in the form of Mirror's Edge Catalyst an open-world reimagining of DICE's opus that would be met with equal parts fanfare and frustration. This is the history of Mirror's Edge. The mid-2000s were a restless period for DICE. Electronic Arts, ever interested in expanding its repertoire of developers, had come to own a majority stake in the Stockholm-based studio and seemed intent on acquiring it in full. Both parties had worked together amicably on the Battlefield series in the past, and there was no reason to suggest that the forthcoming acquisition would fracture their relationship. Yet many within the studio wanted to stretch their creative muscles and remind the world that DICE was still independent for the time being that it still had the means to create something wholly original and unique. Over the course of a year and a half, a host of closely knit teams within DICE came together to pitch a variety of new game concepts to DICE's then CEO, Patrick Soderlund. Soderlund was no less interested at the time in showing off his studio's creative acumen, but he also wanted to ensure that whatever they made next would prove worthwhile and found it difficult to get on board with most of their pitches. Nothing stood out to him as being so original or unique that it was begging to be made. Until one day, one of the teams presented him with a pitch for a first-person parkour game. At first, Soderlund was skeptical of its potential. He knew as well as any of DICE's designers that in order for it to be successful, the studio would need to work hard to ensure players were provided with a strong sense of spatial awareness within its virtual world and felt consistently comfortable navigating it. When his first demo made the rounds at the company, however, it was almost immediately apparent that its creators had stumbled upon something special. Parkouring up and around obstacles within its environment felt simply sublime, as well as drastically different from anything else that had come before it. While questions still abounded about how the parkour game would function as a full feature complete experience, Soderlund couldn't deny any more that they had stumbled upon something of merit. Yet he would only truly get on board with it after its designers returned with a new prototype that featured even more refined movement and a bright, minimalist art style. The latter was immediately striking and utterly unlike the overwhelmingly drab color palettes that were infesting so many other games within the industry at the time. It was immediately apparent to all involved that with a single screenshot, they would be able to instantly set their project apart from their competitors and communicate to players that they were trying to do something different. Mirror's Edge was officially greenlit, but DICE's work was only just beginning. While many within the studio were already decently comfortable with the way their parkour game controlled, they knew that most players would have difficulty coming to grips with it. Would they suffer from motion sickness when they booted it up for the first time? And, sick or not, how easily would they be able to wrap their heads around its gameplay? These questions lingered over their heads, 
and over the next few years, the team would try its best to implement features and changes that enhanced its usability and uniqueness in equal measure. For example, the team decided early on that when Faith would approach an object in her environment that could be useful for progression, like a pipe or a ramp, the object in question would highlight in red. This feature, which the team would dub Runner Vision, allowed them to not only communicate more easily to players how they could best get through the game's levels, but also fill said levels with a novel effect that worked well with the rest of its visual style. Likewise, when developing the game's user interface, the team decided to remove as many on-screen graphics as possible in order to make players feel like they had truly stepped into Faith's shoes. But they made a point of keeping a single, small dot at the screen center, as they found that doing so lessened motion sickness and gave players an aiming point when attempting to grab objects. While many decisions and adjustments of this nature took place during the project's early stages, fully getting the mechanics and world of Mirror's Edge right took the entirety of its development period. It was a challenge, the likes of which nobody at DICE had ever experienced before. But at the end of the day, the team took solace in knowing that unless they had good reason to do so, their corporate overlords were unlikely to step in and cancel Mirror's Edge out of the blue. The amount of people who were assigned to it was fairly small by the standards of most AAA developments, and while nobody wanted it to perform poorly, there was no concern that DICE would go under if it flopped at retail. Rain or shine, the studio already had the financial backing of the Battlefield series and EA keeping it insulated from harm. And because it was based in Sweden, representatives from EA weren't popping in too frequently to question the game's progress. When Mirror's Edge finally released in November of 2008, it came less than a month after the release of Visceral Games' Dead Space and was spotlighted alongside the latter by EA as evidence of its willingness to experiment with new original properties. Yet unlike Dead Space, which managed to receive almost universal acclaim, Mirror's Edge's reception was notably more divisive. Players almost universally concurred that the game did a fantastic job of making one feel as if they had stepped into Faith's shoes, and making most of the game's hurdles feel genuinely thrilling to overcome. Unlike so many other games that featured first-person perspectives, controlling Faith felt like controlling a full-bodied human being who was actually going through all of the trials that were physically laid before, instead of a disembodied arm that was floating through 3D space. And there was almost no disagreement that the dystopia Faith inhabited, despite being inherently sinister, was entrancing in its beauty, with its clean, minimalist visual style, and its quiet ambience sticking firm in the minds of most who experienced it. Yet many felt that all of this thrill and beauty was undercut by a number of ill-conceived design elements. Chief among these elements was the game's combat system. Faith punched and kicked awkwardly when confronting enemies, and used stolen guns with little finesse. From a narrative standpoint, it made sense that Faith wouldn't be a great fighter. She was a runner, not a trained soldier and thus had no reason to be naturally good at taking out other people. But because the game forced many of these combat scenarios to happen, and these combat scenarios didn't get any less frequent over the course of its campaign, most players found this lack of combat ability hard to appreciate. Many also felt that while Faith herself was a likable heroine, the story that she took part in over the course of the game was weak, its plot was rambling, its supporting cast was forgettable, and the majority of it was shown off using animated cutscenes that felt at odds with the rest of the game's visual presentation. At the end of the day, however, as much as some players felt that these issues cast an immeasurable long shadow over the game's strengths, others found them easy to pardon. From their perspective, DICE had created something truly unique, and growing pains were inevitable when achieving something that had never been done before. And while this enthusiasm wouldn't immediately translate into sales, it would keep Mirror's Edge on the tip of the industry's tongue for a while after, and result in it selling decently over time. In an interview with Oz Gamer shortly before Mirror's Edge released, DICE's Owen O'Brien expressed that the studio had big plans for their parkour series going forward. They saw their inaugural title as the first part of a trilogy of future releases that would focus on Faith's journey, and that beyond this, there was plenty of room for future stories that could be told from other characters' perspectives. While other personnel from DICE and DA would express less specific thoughts on where they exactly believed that the series was headed during this time, 
Almost everyone seemed to agree that the nascent series was deeply important to both companies, and that a sequel was inevitable. And before long, not one, but two new Mirror's Edge titles did arrive. On the iPhone, and on personal computers in the form of a Flash game. A full-bodied official sequel, however, would remain elusive over the years that would follow. News, rumors, and speculation of Mirror's Edge's status would find their way online on a semi-frequent basis, but rarely did any of the three paint a picture of a series that was in amazing health. At best, the series' proprietors were merely having difficulties figuring out where to take it next, with EA CEO John Riccatello telling Kotaku in late 2009 that projects were actively being worked on, and that the team was unsure whether they wanted to take them in more of an action-focused direction or a more puzzle-focused direction. And at worst, any and all developments on its future were frozen in place, with Swedish outlet Press to Play TV implying as much in a report in 2010. Not helping matters was the fact that all the while this was happening, the Battlefield series was becoming larger than ever before, and stepping up to compete directly with the likes of Call of Duty. From the outside, it seemed as if the Swedish studio had its hands full, and lacked the bandwidth to develop anything other than its military shooter. Exactly what was going on behind the scenes at DICE during this period, and why it was taking its staff so long to produce a follow-up to Mirror's Edge, would only come into focus years later. In a 2016 Polygon article on the series' history, Soderlund would explain how once the dust surrounding the original Mirror's Edge settled, he felt it important that the studio not rush its sequel's development. He wanted the series' next step to be evolutionary, instead of iterative, and as a result, decided to let small groups of developers within DICE quietly pitch concepts that they believed would enable it to advance to the next level. While the demands of the Battlefield series did stifle its development during this period, the series for the most part progressed slowly because, much like during the development of the original Mirror's Edge, Soderlund and others at EA were eager to take their time and quickly reject any pitch that these groups presented that didn't seem like it would be revolutionary. Faith, are you there? <laughs> Had a run with Kruger, but I got something for it. I'm taking her out! <laughs> Eventually, however, Dice's Sarah Johnson and Eric Odudal presented their superiors with a winning pitch, noting that almost all of the other ideas that their peers had presented to them were linear and level-based in structure. The two pitched an open-world iteration of Mirror's Edge where players would be able to freely explore the environment around them. Soderlund and the others were initially skeptical of the idea, but eventually relented. Even if it wasn't on the scale of a Grand Theft Auto, an open world would allow the team to expand tremendously upon the game's movement mechanics as well as implement features that didn't work in wholly linear environments, like side quests. Once this aspect of the project was confirmed, everything picked up steam in 2012. Environments were blocked out, narrative beats were written up, and Faith's movement mechanics were tweaked and tailored to best suit the grand new world that she would soon be thrust into. New mechanics were introduced, such as skill trees that would allow players to level up Faith's abilities, while old ones, such as gunplay, were removed wholesale. Mirror's Edge Catalyst was born, and its future appeared immeasurably bright. When EA finally started showing Catalyst off to the public, however, fans were cautiously optimistic about its prospects. It was unbelievable that the studio was finally giving the series another lease on life, but it was hard to tell at a glance whether the sequel's litany of new bells and whistles would benefit or hinder it. That most of the team working on Catalyst was entirely new to the series only raised more concerns. It was good to have new blood fueling creative endeavors, but the team that had worked on the original Mirror's Edge had first-hand experience of what had gone right and wrong during its development. Would the Catalyst team be able to channel what their predecessors had learned and deliver a better product? When Mirror's Edge Catalyst finally arrived in June of 2016, the answer to this question appeared to be no. Parkouring through its shining dystopia was as satisfying as ever, but critics almost universally agreed that everything surrounding and complementing its parkour was less than stellar. Its skill trees were awkwardly implemented, its combat still didn't feel right, and its story was yet again a disappointment. Its open world sat in between critics' range of emotions, 
Most tended to agree that exploring it yielded genuine moments of satisfaction, but that this satisfaction couldn't fully stave off a sense of sterility that permeated its environments. That the game had an open world period was also viewed by some as being a bit ironic. While there was no argument that the open world succeeded in making Catalyst feel very different from its predecessor, it also made Catalyst feel very similar to most of the other AAA games around it. And historically, Mirror's Edge's appeal had been that it was so dissimilar to most of the other AAA games around it. Catalyst wasn't an utter disaster, or even all that much worse than the original Mirror's Edge. But after waiting nearly a decade for DICE to take another swing at the series, it was hard not to be disappointed by the studio's second go. Before Catalyst was released, Soderlund made it clear that the series' future laid in the hands of the gaming community. If they could convince DICE that there was still a market for Mirror's Edge, then it would oblige them with another entry. And if they couldn't, the studio would continue to focus its resources elsewhere. Unfortunately, while Catalyst didn't end up bombing, its sales failed to paint a picture of an industry ravenous for more of Face Adventures, with figures putting it between 1.7 and 2 million units sold. Given how long it took DICE to release Catalyst after the original Mirror's Edge, it's not impossible that the Swedish studio might re-emerge with a third entry after another equally long leave of absence. But time cannot heal all wounds, and EA is unlikely to return to the series until it significantly lowers its own standards of success, or the market suddenly develops a massive appetite for first-person parkour all over again. Thank you for watching our video. Our documentaries are crowdfunded and made possible by your continued support for us. We'd like to thank by name the generous patrons who have pledged to our highest reward tier. Caleb Shishkifich, Darira Sigurdsson, EmuMovies.com, Jefferson Dos Santos Oliveira, Maktoum Said Al Maktoum, Nick, Timur Turis Bekov. If you enjoy our content, please consider subscribing to our channel and joining us on Patreon. Thank you.